Today we want to consider the early 20th century uh, as, as a sequel to the work of Marx in the 19th century. Uh, and so we look at the question of imperialism, uh, a systemic issue, uh, and we look at the work of uh, Hobson, Lenin, and Luxembourg. First, a little background. Imperialism emerges in the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, this is built on the earlier plunder of the African uh, continent's coastal areas as part of the slave trade. Uh, I think it's a little different, though, from what became imperialism later, because imperialism uh, reaches deep into the heart of other countries and seizes the, pro the produce there, as opposed to simply uh, devastating a continent through the slave trade. Neither one's any good, but the point is that imperialism is more of a system that emerges in the latter part of the 19th century rather than the slave trade, which was more of a 17th and 18th century uh, process. About 10 million square miles of Africa were colonized by the early 20th century, which is about 93% of the land area of Africa. And uh, the major imperialists were France and Britain. Uh, with 40 and 30 percent of this land area under their colonized rule. About a quarter of uh, this uh, colonized area w was uh, German, uh, dominated by Germany, and uh, some other imperialists were involved, Belgium, Portugal, and Spain as well. Uh, and it wasn't just Africa, of course. The imperialists uh, cast their net very broadly, uh, took over and dominated and in, in inserted themselves in much of Latin America, all throughout Asia, East and South Asia. And, um, and the United States even got in on the act towards the end of the 19th century, seizing parts of the Pacific and Caribbean as part of their sort of late entry into the imperialist system. We could say that about a quarter of the world's population outside of those uh, advanced countries was subjugated and put under capitalist domination by Europe and the United States. Interestingly, some of the other writers that we'll be considering uh, the neoclassical economists did not even think of this as a major phenomenon. After all, Jevons, Menger, Valra, they were all writing in the latter part of the 19th century, and yet this incredible transformation of the world uh, was outside of their purview. Why? They're economists, right? Well, they focused on exchange processes, and so if you're not really describing a pure market economy, it really wasn't of interest to them. Uh, and so the plunder of Africa and of much of the rest of the world by the imperials just is not seen by them as a primarily an economic question. However, the, the, the orthodox neoclassical economists were not the only ones around. Other writers did address this issue. Hobson, of course, is the famous one uh, who published his study uh, in 1902. Um, he argued that it was economic business interests, especially in the large combines, you know, the big corporations and so on, and banks that drove imperialism. You know, he, he rejected the idea that somehow imperialism was simply a political decision that was somewhat irrational, or that it was a national imperative, you know, to build up the nation, or that it was just the patriotic duty of people to join in in this effort. Uh, and certainly he rejected the idea, that, which unfortunately was very popular, <laughs> Uh, among some people at least, that imperialism was essentially missionary work to Christianize the savages and give them an opportunity to uh, reach um, heaven. Uh, and there were many other rationales, but all, all of these were rejected by Hobson who said, look, we got to look at the business interests, the banks, and the large combines. He, like Marx, argued that accumulation was the driving force of capitalism. This is not anything new to any of us, I think. I, I, accumulating more and more capital is, seems to be the, the, the routine consideration uh, in a capitalist economy. Um, but Hobson points out that reinvestment was therefore central to capitalism's vi viability and vitality uh, because you had to reinvest and to accumulate. Um, but he argued that profitable places to reinvest were limited in England he was a British writer, um, which tended to drive the capital abroad. Uh, and we'll talk about why these profitable places uh, didn't exist in great number in England. 
but the big the big uh, forces in in Brit in Britain that uh, drove the export trade, which is what driving capital abroad really is associated with, are the financiers, the big banks, uh, the arms manufacturers, who were of course interested in selling ever more rifles and other weapons for the purpose of subjugating other peoples, and those who manufacture for the export trade. So certainly the textile. Uh, you know, the textile corporations and so on were among those who really were beneficiaries of British imperialism. But Hobson, although he asserted that there wasn't, the, were, there were not that many profitable opportunities within England, he said, "Why, why couldn't the capitalists simply produce enough of the commodities at home, and then through trade benefit from international relations? Uh, why did they have to actually invest and set up um, you know, subsidiaries and so on, other other places?" And even more important, why destroy cultures and take them over? Uh, he was sort of a liberal in that regard. He's was pained by that. Well, Hobson's analysis was that uh, the monopolies gained so much money from their uh, uh, from their monopoly profits. Remember, that goes beyond what they should be getting, uh, according to the even neoclassical theory. Um, they got so much money they couldn't really spend it all uh, because it was just so much. Uh, and then workers. Uh, also could not spend very much because of their meager wages, which of course was part of the reason why the concentrated monopolies got so much money. So there was no really good investment outlets at home. There was no aggregate demand that would uh, allow for the full use of the reinvested surplus. Too much forced savings in short, and it needed an outlet, so it had to go abroad. But it could not succeed abroad as long as countries were not civilized. That's an interesting term. What is meant by that, by the imperialists, was market-oriented with institutions that supported a market system. Now, this isn't really naive under-consumptionism uh, on the part of, of uh, Hobson, um, because really you've got to think, what, what could these concentrated capitalists do? They could either spend their income and stockpile a bunch of un unsold goods, they're usually not a good idea, or refuse to spend all their money and then reduce effective demand, which would ensure a glut, or they could find a foreign place to invest. So it's it's pretty straightforward that the investment abroad was a way for the economy to continue to grow and develop. Now Hobson argued uh, that it wasn't the capitalist system itself, but that that could be uh, tamed a little bit if we supported uh, trade unionism and socialist uh, social welfare policies. Uh, this would increase equity and in income distribution. This would lead to more spending and therefore less need for going abroad, uh, reduce the need for imperialism, and would also offset the tendency towards depression at home. So he felt those reforms that were essentially redistributing the revenues from production to workers and uh, both in the form of higher wages and condition and benefits and also in terms of more nationally provided uh, benefits and uh, uh, and um, benefits and uh, uh, entitlements uh, that would offset this drive towards imperialism. Rosa Luxemburg was a second writer in this tradition, um, and she was murdered by the German army, uh, the Free Corps, in uh, 1919 during an effort at revolution in Germany by the Spartacist League. Uh, now in her uh, model, uh, she thought that the way to think about the world uh, is a two-sector model where sectoral imbalance was inevitable. Uh, so you have imperialism, therefore, is required by capitalism. In fact, she thought imperialism was really an extension of Marx's idea of primitive accumulation. Uh, remember, Marx's primitive accumulation was things like the slave trade, the robbing of the so-called new world of gold and uh, all of that went into creating the original accumulations needed to launch capitalism. And so she argued that imperialism is simply an extension of that process where the world is ravaged to meet the needs for markets, for, for home industries and for places to invest. And he, she thought there were four, four objectives in this process of imperialism. First of all, they just want to grab the raw materials, and we still see that in the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo. There's a constant battle over who's going to get the 
the uh, various uh, rich minerals of that area. Um, so first, to ga gain possession of raw materials and, and have control of them, not just buy them, but actually control them. And then you want to separate the workers from the means of production to create wage laborers. So this is a very important concept. Remember that the enclosure movement in England basically drove workers away from, the, from their ownership of small plots of land and into the cities where they had nothing but their own labor to sell. So they became wage laborers, which fueled the development of industry. Well, she thought the same kind of process was going on here. You go into a country where there is natural economy, where there is cooperative labor in a small village, and instead you uh, separate the workers from having control of their means of production, make them into wage laborers on plantations, rubber plantations, or whatever the plantations might be, uh, in order to uh, create the market system there. And so you, in the process of doing this, you transform a natural economy into a market economy. And so you then create this kind of div division of labor into industry, trade, and agriculture, which in a natural economy had basically been interconnected, but now no longer are. And that opens the way for the penetration economically of the imperialists. Lenin is the, probably the most famous writer in this genre of uh, imperialism, and certainly it was the most successful in, in bringing about social change as he led the Communist Party to victory in 1917, uh, the first successful communist revolution that actually lasted for a while um, in the history of humanity. He wrote uh, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism in early 1916 and published it in 1917. Note that that's at the, towards the latter part of World War I. And I think the best way to think about Lenin's work is to see it as an extension of Marx's laws of motion of capitalism. The characteristics of imperialism he, that he laid out are the monopolization of each industry. Again, this was something Marx had already observed and predicted uh, when he talked about the concentration and centralization of capital. The creation of a financial oligarchy, the fusion of bank and industrial capital dominated by the financiers. So in a sense, as the banking industry becomes monopolized, it begins to have much more power over the industrial capitalists. And so when they both get very large, the banking sector has the greatest power. Um, so that's the creation of what we call the financial oligarchy in the United States. We might call that Wall Street. Uh, the export of capital then becomes a characteristic, as Luxembourg and others noted, and. Uh, the cartels in the world divide up each market, and the imperialists have divided the entire world among themselves. So by the turn of the 20th century, uh, Lenin argued that pretty much the world's pretty much divided up among the imperialists, and so it's not like there's any virgin territory from the standpoint of the imperialist virgin territory to take. But imperialism experiences uneven development, a very fundamental characteristic of dialectics, uh, and that is that uh, in this specific case that led up to World War I, uh, we have Germany, which just didn't even become a country until 1870, 1871, under Bismarck. And then it grew rapidly internally once it was consolidated into a, its own country. Uh, Great Britain had been the established imperialist throughout the 19th century, dominating global trade, holding extensive colonies throughout the world, dominating world finance uh, for sure. And, but Germany was rising, right? And so that rise created a tension leading to World War I, since Germany was trying to break out of the uh, straitjacket that England had her in. Uh, all of the international institutions, all of the established trade relations were with Great Britain, but Germany felt it was stronger now, it needed to have grab some of that itself. And so war is therefore, in Lenin's view, an inevitable outcome of the uneven development of imperialism and of capitalist development in those countries. Uh, the imperialists will, with a growing economy, will, will always seek to gain its rightful share of colonies. The established imperialists will seek to block that. And so this sort of is a, kind of a weird sort of idea about entitlements based on your internal economic strength is going to lead to war. And that's it for today. Talk to you very soon.